Well, it's a truly great uh, honour to be here, Sergio, and uh, to honour you in this, this occasion. Um, perhaps I'm the one who travelled the furthest to get here, so, uh, and I would have gone to the moon, but I didn't have to do that, fortunately. Um, so what I'd like to uh, talk to you about this morning is uh, some new ideas in an old idea, the old idea being uh, relay auto-tuning, and I'll just add some little embellishments. And uh, <coughs> all of this work was uh, motivated by a particular problem I've been working on with colleagues for the last five years. And I'll end my talk by trying to show you some uh, application to that problem. So uh, everybody has tried to summarise Sergio, and uh, I, I will also try to do it. Um, an engineer, a researcher, a tremendous scholar, uh, which is something everybody knows and appreciates Sergio, but also a friend. And even those who know Sergio only a little consider him to be a very close friend, and that's something very special, I think, about you. So, right. thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, I thought I'd try to, to link what I said somewhat to uh, Sergio's work. And these are, these are things that I've read. This is probably a, a sort of a short list of, from a very long list, but things that I know about, uh, obviously uh, the Riccati equation, periodic systems, standard cum filtering, system identification, software reliability, predictive control, many applications to real-world problems, and an old result on estimation of sinusoids and coloured noise. And so uh, I thought, well, given this list and many others I couldn't fit on the slide, why don't I pick the first on the list and the last one? And it happens to link very nicely to what I'm going to, uh, to talk about. So I'm going to touch on a little bit of Riccati equations, and I'm going to touch a little bit on estimating uh, sinusoids and coloured noise. Okay, so I do want to link it, if I can, to Sergio's work. And um, I went back 20 years <laughs> to this paper, uh, which was getting unbiased estimates of sinusoids in coloured noise. And uh, part of that paper uh, uses this uh, little filter and uh, if I remember correctly, adjusted this function on the top in order to get unbiased estimates. And the rest of my talk uh, is built on this little teeny filter. So it's just one, one idea in the talk. This is a highly resonant filter. And this is it without that uh, nonlinear adjustment in it. Um, and uh, I'm going to consider this little filter when the damping ratio, that's this uh, xi symbol, is very much less than one. If you prefer, I could talk about the Q of the filter, which is essentially one over this. So I'm interested in high Q filters. Uh -huh. So that's uh, the basic uh, underlying structure I want to look at. And um, the first thing I want you to have a think about is the frequency response of that filter. So this is the magnitude of the frequency response as a function of frequency around the resonant frequency. So this is one decade below, and one decade above, and this is the phase shift. And this is for different uh, cues, or in this case it's shown for different damping ratios. So I'm going to in a moment uh, point your attention to this light blue line. So just note where it is, and I'll come back to it in a, in a second. That's for one particular damping ratio. Okay, so the thing that's interesting to me about this filter is not only that it has unity gain and zero phase shift at the resonant frequency, but it's possible for very small changes in frequency around that resonant frequency to get very large phase shift. And I'll take you back to the previous slide in a second. But in fact, for damping ratio of 0.05, then for a gain change of less than a half, one can get plus or minus 60 degrees phase shift. So let me take you back to the previous slide. If we now look at 
this damping ratio of 0 0.05, which is the light blue line, then you can see that if you want plus or minus 60 degrees phase shift, this is zero phase shift at the resonant frequency. And plus or minus 60 degrees lies about here, and you can see that that corresponds up here to less than a half change in gain. So I'm going to uh, exploit that idea in, in a second. Okay, so I'm going to use this in the context of uh, relay auto tuning, and uh, I knew that Carl would be here, so this is an appropriate link to your work as well. Um, and uh, this, this is a fantastic idea, I think, in, for applications. And the reason is that if you're doing real experiments on a system, and you do an experiment at one frequency range, and the system's even mildly nonlinear, then that model will not connect very well to models at other frequency ranges. And I've tried this many times, and they just don't bolt up properly. And so you have to ask the question, well, where do you want this model? And of course, if you're doing uh, control system design, where you want it is at the so-called critical frequency, where the plant phase shift is roughly 180 degrees. Classical control tells you you start there, and then add phase advance if you're lucky, and where you go with PID design or phase advance, phase lag design or whatever you want to do. So looking at the critical frequency overcomes this problem of the models not being able to bolt together. And the beautiful thing about relay auto tuner is that it chooses, it self-selects self that. So you don't need to know anything advance, it will do that for you. And this is the basic mechanism that you've got some system and you put a simple relay on it which produces a self-sustaining oscillation. That self-sustaining oscillation is where the loop uh, frequency shift is 180 degrees and so by measuring uh, essentially the fundamental component of this and the fundamental component of the output, you can calculate the gain at the critical frequency, it also gives you the critical frequency and you know the phase shift is 180 degrees. So that's the basic idea. Um, it works extremely well uh, in practice. There are known difficulties and Carl and many others have worked on those. The first one being if you've got uh, a load disturbance. So you're just operating at some operating point, then you get an asymmetrical oscillation. It's the first thing that people looked at. Uh, but if you have broadband disturbances and noise, there are other difficulties, all of which have been looked at. And so there are many remedies available. But the problem I want to look at, and I'll come back to at the end, has huge broadband disturbances, which are very similar to the output of the relay, uh, and are many times the size of any oscillation that you would ever dare to produce using the relay. Uh, uh, roughly 10 to 1 or maybe 20 to 1 in size from the disturbances to uh, the output of any sensible relay. So, um, we thought of a rather silly idea initially. Why don't we put a resonant filter in the loop and if we know roughly the oscillation frequency, then this will focus things on that and get rid of all the noise and so on elsewhere. Of course, the major difficulty is you don't know the resonant frequency. That's the whole point. You don't know the critical frequency. But to our great surprise, this worked perfectly well. And why can that be? Well, why it is, is that these resonant filters with very small gain change will give you phase shifts between plus and minus 60 degrees. So even if you don't set the critical frequency, the resonant frequency at the critical frequency of the plant, it automatically adjusts itself to give you the additional phase shift that you need, as long as you're in a range of about plus or minus 60 degrees, which is a huge range. You know, in, in, in practical problems, uh, I sort of felt I knew the, where the critical frequency was within that range. And this works then perfectly well. With a slight gain change, but that gain compensation is easy to make because you know it's not, at the it's not at the resonant frequency, a little bit away. So you just look up that previous graph and you say, I need to add 30 degrees to the phase shift or subtract 30 degrees. So it's easy. 
And in fact, that suggests there's a mechanism for getting on to the critical frequency. You see, if you're below, the, that it's oscillating below the uh, resonant frequency of the filter, and then you just move the uh, critical frequency up, the resonant frequency up, and vice versa. So you can easily have a little adjustment mechanism that finds the critical frequency anyway, if one exists. Now, there are a few implementation problems. It's sort of like saying, don't try this at home, unless you think about it a little bit. The first one is that we know the settling time of a resonant filter like this is one over the damping ratio, roughly. Right. And so it will take quite a while to settle, and I'm interested in experiments on humans, and they don't like to sit around for days waiting for me to do an experiment. And so uh, you have to have something. But this is well motivated by Riccati theory, because this says that if you don't know the uh, thing you're looking for to begin with, you should use a time-varying Riccati equation, which gives you a time-varying gain. And you can simplify that to just saying you should change the damping ratio. Start wide and then home in. Right? And I've used that in many applications, rolling mills and other things, for the same filter. Now, the next thing is, if you're doing highly, uh, high Q filtering in, in uh, practice with digital implementation, this, this is actually a little bit tricky. <laughs> and so you have to pay attention to uh, numerical aspects. An Euler approximation is definitely not going to be at work. It'll be unstable. Uh, and you need to be very careful about the, ga the choice of the gains. And I must say that when I started doing this, it's in a book with Rick Middleton, my colleague, we actually have gains for this filter. And when I tried them on the problem I'll describe in a minute, they were unstable. Right. But with a little bit more attention to discrete time Riccati equations, um, we managed to get this. It looks simple, but this is an implementation which will work uh, at a small sampling rate. We're talking about 10 minute samples with time constants of two or three hours. That's small sampling, long time constants. Uh, this, and this has been done in, in incremental form, so you take out what you already know and then add the rest. And uh, uh, this seems to work uh, satisfactorily. You do need to worry a little bit about numerical issues if you're doing high Q filtering in uh, embedded controllers. Okay, so a little example from the literature. This, uh, I think, is um, uh, one from chemical engineering. Uh, oh, I had his name a second, I forget. Anyway, it's a standard example. This one will resonate very easily with the standard uh, filter. And, uh, one of the, and people have tried this with different types of noise, low-frequency low noise, offsets, high-frequency measurement noise. Usually the strategy is to build some sort of bandpass filter, right? Um, but uh, I'm interested in trying this uh, uh, very, very large disturbances. Disturbances I'm talking about here are 10 times the relay output, and they sort of look very similar to the relay output. Um, and so this is uh, one with uh, Tom Edgar, is the name I was trying to think of, uh, used a uh, bandpass filter and you can see this is quite unsatisfactory. This is meant to be uh, an a oscillation produced by the relay. Uh, this is after the filtering. Uh, what's the amplitude? Uh, I don't know. And you, if you look at this carefully, the critical frequency is moving all over the place as the disturbance is hit it. OK. And this is the same result using a, the resonant filter. The resonant filter pulls in to the critical frequency. Uh, you can see this is the... Uh, plant output, but after filtering you can see you get a nice sine wave whose amplitude you can measure and you get a nice constant frequency for the relay switching. And so um, for this, for this uh, uh, toy example it works quite well. Some simple embellishments. Because the relay is uh, sort of a bit selective, you can do various things. Systems that normally don't produce an oscillation, because this relay, they, the uh, resonant filter will give you 60, plus or minus 60 degrees phase shift. You can put it on a first order system, or almost, <laughs> uh, and you'll get extra 60 degrees. First order wouldn't work, but uh, a second order system is, won't work with relay auto tuning because you can only get 180 degrees phase shift. 
at infinite frequency. Put it on with this, the relay will give you the additional phase shift to give you a nice oscillation. You can do that. Multiple variable system, you can put multiple ones of these operating at once. And because of the selectivity of the resonance, you can do all this simultaneously. Uh, systems that are open loop unstable is no problem because the actual, you, you can put a ordinary controller on to stabilize the system and the, the resonant filter will not see that so then you get a relay tuning on, for the unstable system, the initial conditions being dealt with by other feedback. And you can use this to estimate the plant transfer function at different frequencies, just put different uh, filters on with different frequencies. and that works all at the same time. Okay, so I started out by saying I wanted to apply this to a particular problem, and a particular problem uh, that I've worked on for a number of years now is uh, uh, type 1 diabetes. Um, I don't know, I, I got in this by complete accident. It's not something I wanted to do. I was at a conference uh, in China, a gentleman came up to me from BD Technologies and said, uh, uh, you seem to know something about control. Do you know anything about diabetes? And I said, not a single thing. And he said, you're the person I want to talk to then. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I spent, did a, a contract with them and got an interest, uh, set up a little team of engineers and uh, medi medical professionals uh, to see if we could understand uh, this, this disease. Um, it, 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 this is a major worldwide problem. It's one of the uh, most uh, mo uh, the most use of national international expenditure on health is diabetes. One person in ten in the world has some form of diabetes, and one person in a hundred has uh, type one diabetes which is an autoimmune disease, usually detected when people are young, five years old. My niece was detected with it when she was 38. Uh, my mother uh, was detected with type 1 diabetes uh, when she was 40 years old, and it ultimately led to her death. So I have an interest in type 1 diabetes, but there's, I don't know how many people in the room, there's probably 50, don't put your hand up, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was a type 1 diabetic in this audience uh, because uh, if I ever give a talk to 100 people, there is. I gave a talk with 300 people recently. I said, I bet there's three people with type 1 diabetes in the audience and four people came up afterwards and said, we're the people with type 1 diabetes. Okay, so it ha it's a devastating chronic disease. Uh, if you have too high a blood sugar level, then uh, it causes long-term health issues, blindness, uh, cardiovascular disease, loss of uh, limbs, uh, bl blindness, etc. If your blood sugar goes low, then it has an immediate consequence. You become confused, uh, even more than so than usual. <laughs> um, you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so I looked at Michelle when I said that. <laughs> um, you can go into a coma uh, and uh, even death. One of the uh, uh, things that is sort of controversial in type 1 diabetes is a problem called dead in bed. And um, dead in bed uh, is, uh, why it's controversial is that uh, it's, it's not totally known that the cause is uh, low blood sugar, although they assure it's a contributing factor. And if you want to read about that it, for a particular person, uh, in Australia there's a, a huge foundation supporting type 1 diabetes research called the uh, Danny Meads Barlow Foundation. And Danny Meads Barlow was a gorgeous 16-year-old girl who went to bed perfectly healthy and never got up in the morning. And there's a whole story about her on that website. Okay, so uh, why, why am I interested in, in uh, doing uh, identification on this? It's kind of obvious if you want to do some sort of controller, and all medical treatment is a form of control. What does a physician do? He makes measurements and says, okay, we need to adjust your treatment in some way, and that can be done over a long period of time, two monthly visit to the doctor, or 
uh, you can be doing it regularly yourself to say, oh, my blood sugar's high, I need to inject a bit of insulin now. So it's, you can either have tight feedback uh, or long-term feedback. So it's this quintessential control problem. The sensitivity to insulin can vary a lot. It obviously changes over time with maturity, uh, how we feel, if you're angry, if you're tired, sensitivity to insulin changes. If you Even if you get a common cold, your sensitivity to insulin can change by up to two to one and stay elevated for uh, weeks after a common cold. So it seemed desirable to, to try something and I thought I'd try relay auto tuning. But the problem is that you eat food, you do exercise, and though the response of those is like 10, 20 times any relay you could ever hope. And so relay auto tuning didn't seem to work, broad brand disturbances, so try the relay. Right? And in fact, that's what motivated this whole work. So uh, little things you need to do. One is to have this time bearing uh, damping so that uh, it, it takes reasonable time to get the model. You'd really like to refit uh, sens insulin sensitivity every day, and we've got that now working. Uh, there are these numerical issues and the gain of the filter and so on all have to be sorted out. And uh, the results I'm about to show you are real results. If anybody works in diabetes, you know that showing real results is quite difficult. Uh, this is for a young person. He did, uh, this is what they call a free living trial. So this person went out into the community, he was eating his breakfast, uh, he was uh, dancing tango, he dances tango, um, he was doing normal exercise, he was getting stressed because he was coming to see me, etc. And uh, these, these are his real results. This is his blood sugar level over the uh, time of the trial, which is 900 minutes, which is what, about 15 hours, so this, this uh, experiment took place. He, he designed his own uh, feedback system, so he's running a, a closed loop system at the same time as doing this relay oil chain. This is the relay output. You, I haven't shown you the other insulin. There's basal insulin flow and there's insulin injection. Oh, I'm, yeah, sorry, yeah, excellent. <laughs> in fact, one of the problems in this whole thing is that you can put insulin in, but it's really hard to take it out. And so that's a good question. Now, this is the perturbations around a basal flow, which is the one you need to deal with exogenous glucose production. And not shown here is the bolusing, because this person is bolusing all the time for meals, etc. So on top of this, this is just the relay part of it. On top of this, there's insulin flows which are... Uh, 50 times what you see here. Right. And this, you can see that after a bit of uh, transient, it settles down and you can measure the, uh, the gain. It's not, the re relay, what the resonant filter was not set exactly at the critical frequency, but immediately just pulls into that because of this phase shift. So there you go, that's, uh, it's working. Um, well, we, we want to try this uh, on more people, it's just one person. Um, I, want to, uh, I have to make some acknowledgements because we've got a team of about 20 people working in this area. These are some of the key people. Um, there's an endocrinologist, a nutritionist, diabetes educator. And in fact, one thing that we know is that dealing with real people, you've got to be very careful how you present this stuff. And so we're also, we also have uh, an iPhone app, a smartphone app, that makes this a little bit more understandable to young people and a bit more user-friendly. So that's one of the things we're doing, and a, and a couple of uh, engineering staff. Okay, so um, I wanted to link it to your work, Sergio. Uh, we've uh, been trying this modified relay auto tuner, which also links to Carl's lovely work on this. I've shown you some real patient results. The work's ongoing. There's a huge distance to go. Uh, this is only, only the beginning. I've been working on this area for five years, and all I know is the beginning. It's, it's a hard problem. And uh, we're going to try some uh, more extensive trials with more patients. So uh, to end, thank you, Sergio, for being a, a friend and being with me. And uh, this isn't as nice as here. Oh, I didn't say it. I didn't wear it. I wore a jacket yesterday. But I didn't wear it today because I wanted to make Sergio look even better. <laughs> <laughs>